Well, I think that we are all in for the moment. So, dear all, welcome to the 2021 edition of the CINE EINS conference on the new ways of investigating the brain. The conference will take place today, tomorrow, next Thursday, and next Friday. As you may know, the conference was scheduled for last year. But due to the still current pandemic, we decided to postpone it in the hope of holding it this year in Milan. Unfortunately, the global crisis is still ongoing and it was safer, we thought, to hold it online. Although it is not ideal, as we will miss all the social events usually associated with our annual conference, we are happy to be able to host you anyhow, and we hope you'll enjoy this conference. As you have seen in the program, we ha will have some plenary session with important scholars, as usual uh, parallel sessions hosting contributors, and two sessions organized in collaboration with the International Neurotic Society, our partner, that I would like to thank very much for organizing this event with us. As long as the plenary session are concerned, as usual, we'll award our medals. This year's CINE medals are going to be awarded to Carl Desroth from Stanford University, Der Perboon from Cornell University, and Vittorio Gallese from the University of Parma. As usual, we had many people replying out to our call of papers. We received 70, uh, 65 papers from 22 different countries, and the papers that will be presented in these days are the best we received. 
this year we introduce a new hour new hours beside our typical medal to invite to invite the speakers selected by the board we have introduced uh, sorry uh, we have introduced a best paper prize for both philosophy and neuroscience to be awarded to the best long abstract among those really saved from contributors the prize amount to 500 euros and the winners of, of our first edition are Best paper prize in philosophy, the paper by Joshua May. Best paper prize for neuroscience, the paper by Carmelo Vicario, Robert Rafal, Giuseppe Di Pellegrino and colleagues. And so all my congratulations to the winners. Uh, now, before leaving to Lavazza, the chair for our first lesson, I have to leave the floor to Sara Songoria for a few technical issues about the conference. Please, Sara. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome all and just a few minor things. Um, as you know, you have all received the, um, the PDF file with the program and you have all the links to access the sessions. And um, all the sessions will be recorded unless speakers explicitly ask otherwise. So please, if you don't wanna be recorded, just tell us. And for participants, please keep your microphones off um, so we can avoid background noises. And, um, and we're gonna be, uh, so we have uh, chairpersons in each session, but alongside with them, there's gonna be uh, some people helping you out, helping you all out with the technical issues. So it would be myself and other colleagues that I would like to thank a lot. And those are Federico Bina, Fran uh, Greta Favara and Francesca Guma. who are gonna help us uh, with the technical issues. Uh, for those of you who are members of uh, CINE, uh, please remember that we have an important meeting on, on next Friday, so the 21st, and we have to elect the board. So it's really important for all of us to be there. So that's all for the technical stuff. If you need anything, just uh, write me and I'll try to help you out. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I have to thank all the organizing committee at, at this point. If I didn't forgot something, uh, I, I'm always looking at Sarah for in this occasion and, and there is a, a special thanking for her. But uh, the organizing company, uh, committee uh, for the work, uh, Nita Farani, Farani, sorry for my pronunciation of the name, uh, Michela Balconi, Mario De Caro, Andrea Lavazza, Massimo Reiklin, Sara Songorian, our partner, International Neuroethics Society, CESEP from the San Rafael University, and all the board for this year's work together. Still again, Michela Barconi, Matteo Cerri, Mario De Caro, Andrea Lavazza, Silvia Pellegrini, Federico Pizzetti, Massimo Reiklin, and, uh, and Sara Songoia. And, and it was a great pleasure and order to work with that. This is my last uh, conference as president of CINE, so I'm very happy to this, about this experience. And uh, I hope that uh, you can uh, uh, enjoy the conference and uh, appreciate the effort of all the people who work hard to uh, organize it. Thank you very much. That's all. Now I, I, I give the floor to Andrea Lavazza. Thank you very much, Michele. Thank you very much, Sara. Hello, everybody. And uh, welcome to this first session of our conference. We are very honored uh, today to have Professor Deiserot and Professor Roach with us. Unfortunately, Matteo Cherry, who was uh, to be the chairperson for this session, had a sudden serious family issue. So uh, he can't be here with us. Matteo, as you know, is a neurophysiologist and would have been much, much more titled than me. I'm just a neuroethicist in introducing our speakers. 
anyway, I try to do my best. We are very pleased to be able to award Carl Deseroth with the Sina Prize for Neuroscience 2021, as he is one of the most innovative scientists in the field, capable of literally changing the way we can study the brain. Professor Deseroth is so famous, I think, that a few words will be enough to introduce him. Carl Deseroth is the D.H. Chen Professor of Bioengineering and of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. He is worldwide known for creating and developing the technologies of hydrogel tissue chemistry and above all, as you all know, I think, optogenetics. This technique, firstly presented in 2005, uses opsin genes encoding like gated ion channels to achieve optogenetic control of neurons, allowing reliable control of action potential with light at millisecond precision. And as many of you know well, Optogenetics is currently one of the most powerful means of investigating brain functions. Professor Deseroth applied this technique to carry out pioneering studies and publish over 300 scientific papers. He is a member of all three US national academies and he has received many, many awards including recently the Leibinger Prize, the Eisenberg Prize, the Canada Gardner International Award, the Kyoto Prize, the Warren Harper Foundation Prize, and the Heineken Prize for Medicine. I'm not sure if the Sina Prize is his first prize in 2021, but I do hope it is a welcome prize anyway. As we have seen just before, the winners of Sina Prize are all authoritative and important scientists in their fields. And now I leave the virtual floor to Professor Deseroth for his Lectio Magistralis. At the end, we may get some few questions. We, we know that uh, our schedule is very tight and the talk by Professor Roach will follow. Please, Professor Desarot, and thank you very much once again for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Andrea. I'm honored, extremely honored to receive this recognition and, and most of all to connect with this community. Uh, mm -hmm. As you no doubt know, uh, questions of neuroethics and neurophilosophy uh, have come up in my field all the time in optogenetics and in related efforts, we find ourselves struggling with and grappling with issues that all of you think about uh, all the time. And as I looked at the agenda, I realized that this is a community I'd like to uh, get to know better. The, just from the titles of the talks, it's clear that you're doing something very important that I need to engage uh, with uh, even more fully. So this is a great opportunity, even though it's a virtual meeting, I'm uh, tremendously excited to make these connections and to get to know you all better and to know your work better. So thank you again, it's a tremendous honor and I'm excited to share our work with you. So I will uh, then share my screen, is that okay? And I'll go right to the, the talk. Yes, okay. Can you see the screen okay? Wonderful. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Great. So uh, uh, thank you again for the invitation to the, the CNA conference and for the, the award. And uh, what I'll share with you today is some very recent work that highlights uh, what I think are some quite deep questions surrounding the uh, nature of the self, which I think is something which will, comes up uh, not infrequently in uh, in the talks of this, this conference in one way or another, as I look at the agenda. 
Uh, and it's quite interesting, I think, and, and instructive that to be able to address these very complex questions like the nature of the self, that a very small organism, a single celled green algae has given us the leverage uh, to ask these questions in a new way, to frame them and to start to uh, get some answers. And I think that's a great story for uh, science and for the public uh, to know. I mentioned dissociation. This is going to be a theme. This is a self-portrait of the uh, pop artist Andy Warhol. You can see here uh, at least three separate uh, representations of the self that are offset from each other. This is not unlike the experience of dissociation in many ways, and it's something that brings into sharp focus questions that are long mysterious and recently accessible. And the way we approach this question <clears throat> in some ways has its very deepest roots in classical genetics and biochemistry. Francis Crick in 1999, he was thinking about what we needed to make progress in neuroscience. And he suggested that uh, we needed to turn the firing of one or more types of neurons on or off in a rapid manner. And he thought the ideal signal would be light. Uncharacteristically for Crick, he had no idea how to do this. He said, this seemed rather, seems rather far-fetched, but conceivable. And that's what we've been able to do with optogenetics. In a way, though, it does bring this principle that's common to biochemistry, indeed to genetics, for more than 100 years, that we bring to neuroscience, which is test hypotheses in a causal manner. We, we seek to test, we seek in neuroscience to have the same ability that other realms of biology have, where they can add or subtract elements that are precisely defined. And with full awareness, just as with genomes, just as with development, that these are very complex systems that have massive feedback and uh, redundancies and flexibilities and nonlinearities. That's okay. It's the same as with the genome, same as with development. But the leverage that we get with precision causal interventions is enormous. And we all know that when we study a gene or a protein, we add or provide the activity of that protein or gene. And what we want to do for neuroscience is do the same thing with the conceptual equivalent of a gene, which is the activity of well-defined neural circuit elements during behavior. And the outcome is hypothesis testing that other realms of science are able to access uh, quite readily, but now applied to the very interesting questions of neuroscience. <clears throat> and here is just a depiction of how this approach has been so powerful in developmental biology. This is a, a Drosophila embryo. And on the right is a mutant that grows a leg in place of the antenna. This is the mutant uh, Antennapedia. And this shows this was incredibly informative, these mutants that in so-called pattern formation and development. Uh, and scientists, without knowing every last detail of how a leg is constructed, nevertheless, were able to perceive this principle that there are pattern formation processes that happen and they're governed by these pattern forming genes. And that uh, led to the uh, Nobel Prize for Christian Nusslein Volhard, uh, Ed Lewis and colleagues uh, some years ago. And again, you don't have to find out every last detail, just as we don't have to know every last spike that happens in every neuron, but we are able to elicit uh, principles from causal interventions. Now, causality in neuroscience is uh, approachable with electrical and magnetic interventions, but not with cell type specificity because all neurons are uh, electrical in nature. With optogenetics, we take single genes or proteins that come from uh, microorganisms that are all-in-one light-activated regulators of ion conductance. Some conduct chloride, some conduct sodium, and these allow us to turn cells on or off. Because these are encoded by single genes, they're very easy to target genetically or anatomically, and we can confer cell type specificity onto cells uh, of our choosing. These are beautiful proteins. They don't look like those little cylinders. They look like this. They're dimers of seven transmembrane proteins. I won't go too much into the biophysics, but we've been able to get crystal structure uh, of the same sort that Francis Crick used to be able to elucid elucidate the double helix of DNA. This is x-ray crystallography, and we've been able to observe the structure of these 
uh, channel rhodopsins in great detail. This is one that conducts positive ions and is excitatory. It'll stimulate a cell. These conduct chloride ions They'll, uh, that'll inhibit the targeted neuron. And we've been able to resolve the nature of the pore and crucially use that knowledge to make new forms of these channel rhodopsins, redesign the pore so other ions come through, different colors are enabled, different speeds of action, and this enables us to operate across all the time scales that we like in neuroscience. Again, I won't go into too much detail here, but just to highlight the opportunity that's arisen from this, we can drive action potentials in the targeted neurons with pulses of blue light at any speed we like, up to hundreds of hertz, hundreds of times per second. We've made red light driven uh, channel rhodopsins. We've made bistable channel rhodopsins that let us flip cells into and out of excitable states without specifying every spike. We can simply specify periods of high responsivity. We've also made inhibitory channel rhodopsins by relining that pore uh, and making it conduct chloride, and we can then get bistable inhibition. This work uh, has been carried out with a tremendous team of students and postdoctoral fellows and collaborators uh, uh, around the world over uh, the past uh, 14 years or so. The outcome, uh, fast forward to the present, has been quite exciting. We can now take, for example, the red light activated channel rhodopsins, and we can put them into all the neurons of a living mouse uh, in the brain, let's say, we can focus in on the visual cortex and we can co-express these red light driven channel rhodopsins with blue light driven reporters of neural activity, calcium indicators that are activated by blue light. So we send in red light to stimulate, we get blue light out and we send in blue light to, to uh, observe the neural activity and we collect light too. So these are all optical experiments, no patch clamp electrodes at all, no uh, wires needed. It's all photons going in and out. And we play in and read out rich streams of data, many hundreds or even thousands of neurons at once. What's shown here, all these little red dots are images of individual uh, neurons that are responding to uh, uh, optical stimulation. And we play in those patterns of light with holograms. These are 3D holograms that we can use to transmit light directly into uh, the uh, tissue. Now, this has been uh, quite exciting, but we don't yet have this full wide field view of the entire brain. If I uh, um, back up here for a moment, what you can see here, this is a one by one millimeter swath of visual cortex. And we focused in our hologram of light on each of these little spots of of light, which are neurons, and we can stimulate those neurons, tens or hundreds, but it's a quite restricted field of view, very big at the time, a couple of years ago, but still uh, just a couple, uh, a small fraction of the overall uh, scope of the dorsal cortex of a mouse. In parallel, we've been working on broadening this field of view. It's not that that small field of view I showed in the previous slide is a, is a problem. In fact, we've been able to play in uh, what looks like percepts to the animal. The animal behaves as if we're playing in a percept to it. The internal representations of the animal are similar to what are naturally uh, occurring during a natural visual stimulus. And so by every definition that we can have, it looks as if we're playing in a, a, a true percept to the animal. However, uh, it's still just a one by one millimeter swath of the brain. And a number of my students over the years have been working on ways to, to broaden our view of the mammalian brain to include uh, most or, or all of cortex. And that's what I want to tell you about today. This uh, allowed us to gain insight into uh, the representations of the self and dissociation. Now, very wide field optics have given us this scope and we use optical readouts of neural activity. When neurons are very active, calcium concentration goes up inside the cell and we have genetically encoded reporters of that elevated calcium that fluoresce. And so when neurons are more active, we can see changes in the fluorescent signal coming out. This is a awake uh, mouse that, uh, we're, that we're recording from in this way, and we're looking at calcium elevation in neurons in real time. And this is an animal that's not getting any particular intervention at all. It gets administration of a non-specific uh, salt solution. And we see these patterns of activity in this awake animal that uh, are not particularly rhythmic or uh, or uh, following any particular pattern that we can see, um, they are 
representative of neural activity, but no pattern leaps out. And we, uh, as part of this work, we began to administer psychoactive agents, agents that fundamentally change in human beings, the nature of perception, nature of reality, and nature of the uh, integration of the self. And as part of this, we administered dissociative agents, um, including ketamine and PCP. And we saw something that was completely surprising, not predicted by anything that we or others had uh, considered, which was a highly localized oscillation, a pulsation in a small patch of dorsal cortex called the retrosplenial cortex. This is uh, one that is conserved across all mammalian species, including human beings. And for some uh, completely unexpected and uh, at the time inexplicable reason, uh, there was this uh, highly localized uh, rhythmic oscillation. It was at uh, about one to three hertz, was quite consistent and uh, did not spread uh, grossly to the other regions. You can see that here, this one to three hertz power is quite restricted to the retrosplenial cortex and that was a consistent finding compared to other cortical regions. Moreover, there was much more that was specific about this. It only showed up with agents that were known to be dissociative, and I'll get back to what dissociation is in just a moment, only agents that were known to cause dissociation in human beings. That includes PCP and MK801, but not other agents, even strongly psychoactive and hallucinogen-like uh, drugs like LSD, uh, which are not dissociative. These did not cause the oscillation to happen. There was even more specificity as well. It wasn't just in this patch of cortex, it was in just the deep layers of cortex, <clears throat> just these deep layer five neurons. And this was an insight that we got by targeting our reporters, our calcium indicators to just the deep cortical layers. In contrast, the superficial layers did not show this rhythmic oscillation that we could see in the deep layers. And that was a consistent finding too. All right, so let's, now that you have a sense of the uh, biological uh, framework that we're working with, uh, let's ask what dissociation actually is. This is a conscious state where cognitive processes that are normally integrated and coherent uh, are selectively uncoupled. And a, a classic example is that sensory stimuli, inputs to the body that are detected uh, uh, by the self, are disconnected from an affective or emotional response. So it's not anesthesia, there's not a numbness, that what's happening is still perceived and yet it's not attributed uh, to the self and so there's no longer an emotional uh, response to it. This is very common, but not well appreciated in the general population or even in the medical population. It's extremely common in PTSD and certainly in all the dissociative disorders of which there are many, uh, personality disorders like borderline personality, Certainly the dissociative drugs cause this. Trauma, uh, people who uh, experience trauma, more than 70% will experience dissociation. It can be part of epilepsy as an aura prior to seizures. And overall, there's about a lifetime prevalence of 10%, so much more common than most people think. Quotes include, if my mind, people describe themselves as being in the passenger seat of a vehicle, looking at themselves driving, or, or you could say you're, if it's like if you're in the audience and you're watching the movie of every aspect of your life uh, without any sort of emotional reaction, that's what this is like. And I'll play, this is a, a, a gentleman uh, describing his experience on uh, ketamine. The realization I'm having on this is that like, that emotion doesn't have like, this, like physicality, right? As well. That there is a distinct difference between what's tangible and what's intangible. Unless you kind of encapsulate all those things in your life, right? All your feelings, your, you know, your relationships, your upbringing, all those other things like sort of ball into one thing and you sort of set it over there and you're just walking around and you're just looking at them and you don't have an emotional reaction or attachment or something to each image or each experience that you see. Okay. And this is, as you all appreciate, very, very interesting, but the self can be separated from the experiences. And these are normally integrated and here they can be separated. So what on earth is going on here? And can we uh, make some headway on this when we're looking at uh, starting from animal studies? <clears throat> and so let's think about this and let's think about the causes and let's look at these, let's broaden our, our view here and let's look at other, other causes. And let's look, what we were fortunate to see is we had a, a patient 
who had uh, an epileptic uh, aura that was dissociative at Stanford. And that gave us a, a, a route into the clinic. This patient uh, described his pre-seizure period as saying he was listening to two parts of his brain speak to each other in a way that a third part, which I considered to be me, was able to listen. And so we look at this and we think, okay, what could we do in, in animals? And we set up a, a test uh, where we administer a non-damaging but uh, uncomfortably warm uh, uh, stimulus to a paw. And there's a quick uh, reflexive stimulus detection that shows that the animal is awake, uh, alert, and not anesthetized. There's a reflexive immediate paw flick. And then there's a more prolonged affective or emotional type response, a volitional grasping of the paw, licking it to cool it, and more prolonged uh, escape responses. And this let us separate the stimulus detection from the affective response. And quite strikingly, we saw that at no dose of ketamine that we explored here did we uh, eliminate the stimulus detection. So there's no anesthesia. But at above 25 milligrams per kilogram, we saw an abolition of the affective or emotional response, exactly as we had hoped to see. Not only that, it was at that dose, 25 and above, where we saw this oscillation start to appear in retrosplenial cortex. And so this was consistent with a causal uh, relationship, although certainly didn't prove it. Not yet. We uh, then considered, uh, is this behavior specific to the dissociative agents? We already showed the oscillation was, what about the behavior? And uh, ketamine uh, gave this pattern of preserving the, the reflexive foot flicks, but abolishing this prolonged affective uh, response. Also, there was a much longer time to escape in ketamine, again, showing a suppression of a self-preservation, uh, long time scale emotional response. This same pattern was seen with PCP, another dissociative agent, but was not seen in any of these other very potent psychoactive substances. So the behavior was specific as well. Now I'm gonna tell you some interesting genetics that let us test necessity and sufficiency of this rhythm for dissociation. And I won't delve too much into it, but just to give you a high level overview, we noticed that there was a pacemaker ion channel, a channel known to give rise to rhythms in excitable tissues like heart and lung. This is called the HCN1 ion channel. The, it's a hyperpolarization activated channel by its very nature. It's well suited to, to creating rhythms. And it was much more highly expressed in retrosplenial cortex than nearby cortex, and much more in the deep layers than in the superficial layers. So that was consistent. And we did a genetic trick, a knockout, a local knockout in retrosplenial cortex of this channel, and we saw effectively an abolition of the rhythm, nearly complete suppression of the rhythm that would occur in wild type animals that had this uh, uh, channel present. Not only that, knocking out the HCN1 channel, which abolished the rhythm, restored the animal's affective or emotional response in ketamine. So even though you're, this animal is still getting global ketamine, the loss, the lack of this HCN1 channel in retrosplenial cortex prevented the uh, abolition of the affective response and in fact restored the, the normal affective response. So this suggested that this HCN1 channel and the rhythm is necessary for the uh, uh, elicitation of this dissociative behavior. What about sufficiency? Can we provide this rhythm? Here optogenetics gives us a, a route in. We can use high-speed optical stimulation and provide this rhythm we have excitatory and inhibitory opsins, and we can set up our, the colors of light that we use to uh, provide the rhythm directly. The origins of these work, of these opsins, uh, and their combined use this way dates back more than 10 years to the work of Viviana Gradinaro in my laboratory in 2010. And we found that when we provide to the bilateral retrosplenial cortex this rhythm, we uh, preserve the uh, stimulus detection reflexive response, but we uh, potently reduce the affective or, or emotional response. And this happens with a retrosplenial cortex intervention, but not in somatosensory cortex, another, of course, very important and relevant uh, area of cortex. So this uh, gave us a confidence of causality. And then uh, we considered this patient that I was telling you about earlier. This was a patient that came into our Stanford Comprehensive Epilepsy uh, Center and described this aura. And uh, as many of you will know, uh, and certainly relevant to, to uh, neuroethics, a rapidly expanding opportunity in this field is uh, stereo EEG. 
This is uh, what happens when patients who have intractable epilepsy are coming in and being considered for surgical resection in order to uh, help them with this uh, seizure syndrome that is not being addressed by medication. And what's done now is that to increase confidence, this is of course a big deal to go in and take out part of the brain and to increase confidence that the causal locus has been identified, there is now a workflow whereby uh, patients come in and spend a week in the hospital. They've got uh, uh, electrodes spanning many parts of their brain, uh, cortical and subcortical structures, and the seizure initiation sites are looked for, and the uh, causality can even be assessed with local microstimulation. And so we looked at this patient and all the data that had been collected during this week-long uh, hospital stay, including the video interviews while the patient was talking. And we noticed that during the dissociative aura, there was a oscillation, a rhythm that was happening uh, in parts of the brain. And where was it? It was in the human homologue of retrosplenial cortex. And these are these deep posterior, posteromedial uh, cortical structures, uh, uh, including a classical retrosplenial cortex and adjacent homologous uh, structures. And the oscillation was only in those deep structures. Uh, and not in other parts of the brain. Moreover, this uh, occurred only during the dissociative aura and it could be elicited by focal microstimulation at these sites. And this quote from the patient, very evocative and classical for dissociation, feeling forced out of the cockpit of a plane, can still see what's happening, can see all the gauges, can see the information flow, but feeling separate uh, from it with causal stimulation. And that only happened when stimulation was given at sites that were naturally able to give rise to this rhythm. So this was uh, quite remarkable and gave us some confidence that we were uh, on the right track. And so here we then uh, could return to the, the mouse work and say, given this confidence that we have that we're on the right track, can we delve deep into the precise mechanisms? How is this happening? How is this separation of two things that are normally an integrated part of the self uh, actually occurring? which of course is, is just fascinating to think about. And so we considered retrosplenial cortex clearly having some important role in this and considering its wiring and use that to guide the mouse equivalent of stereo EEG so we can uh, get a sense of what's going on in this more tractable uh, species. Now, uh, this uh, initially looks complex, but it's actually quite simple. This is some nice work from the Allen uh, Institute, just doing basic assessment of the wiring of different regions of cortex going to different regions of thalamus, this deep, important uh, subcortical interconnection zone, and also connections going from those, from those thalamic areas to the cortical areas. And I'll just highlight retrosplenial cortex here and uh, some interesting features of its projections. Some thalamic nuclei receive and send strong projections to retrosplenial cortex, including AV and LD thalamus. Others that are right nearby are wired differently, like the AM nucleus of the thalamus. And so we planned our trajectories of our recording electrodes to make sure we captured these key thalamic nuclei as well. This is just a representation of what was on the previous slide to remind you of what the areas we're targeting. We introduce these long recording electrodes, much like stereo EEG, uh, many at a time into the animal. And we look uh, pre and post ketamine uh, to see what's going on. And these are correlation plots. Different brain regions are indicated on the X and Y. And uh, red is more correlated and blue is less correlated. In the resting state before ketamine, there are weak positive correlations uh, across the brain. On ketamine, there's right away a strong self-correlation with retrosplenial cortex that's expected from the oscillation. And astonishingly, we saw a strong positive correlation appear with the thalamic nuclei that are known to be strongly wired to retrosplenial cortex. So they're following along with it in its rhythm but adjacent nuclei that are not so heavily connected like AM, not only uh, do not show that, but they seem forced into an inverse correlation. And we can readily understand how this happens from the inhibitory circuitry that's present in the thalamus, uh, in which different thalamic nuclei can inhibit each other through a, a, a feedback inhibition. And so this is represented here also as, as raw data, you can see this antermedial thalamus, which observes many frontal areas of cortex 
being forced into this uh, inverse correlation uh, with retrosplenial in contrast to these uh, more posterior structures. Okay, this is, this is really interesting because this suggests right away a plausible mechanism for what dissociation really is. You've got a, a powerful rhythm in one cortical region and its thalamic uh, partner and those interconnected regions that are following one rhythm. Those that are left out in the cold from that rhythm end up forced into another rhythm that's out of sync and all the cortical areas that they're involved with will be out of sync as well. And this is indeed uh, what seems to be happening. AM, by the way, projects to many of the frontal regions, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex and so on that uh, represent uh, other aspects of the uh, representations of the self. In fact, the somatosensory cortex, pre-ketamine, which is uh, positively correlated with this, these posterior structures like retrosplenial, ends up losing that positive correlation and even dipping a little bit negative. Uh, and this provides a plausible mechanism for how the uh, sensations that are experienced are no longer attributable to uh, the self because they can never appear uh, in synchrony with these uh, posterior uh, structures. So <clears throat> this has been uh, for us a, a, a really uh, thrilling journey to think that we can access these uh, very fundamental questions about the assembly of the self through the leverage that these uh, tiny uh, organisms, the algae give us is, is really, uh, I think a good story for the science. I've also, along the way, I've been inspired by many things that, that we and others have thought about uh, along the way in, in uh, considering uh, how psychiatry more broadly uh, informs uh, questions of neurophilosophy and, and neuroethics. And uh, I recently, I'm a practicing psychiatrist. I've seen a lot of the uh, uh, interesting cases over the years, over the past uh, 20 or so years, and I, along the way, I've collected a, a many of the uh, uh, stories that seemed to me most uh, conceptually and philosophically interesting. And uh, I've put them together now in a book that's coming out in, in uh, just about a month called Projections. This is a, 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 a funny story that I have to share because the, in, in English, the word uh, projections is very rich with connotations. It, it has, of course, you have the uh, implications from psychiatry, where we project uh, something that's inside ourselves, we project it onto other people very often, and we see things that aren't really there, but they're coming from us that we're, uh, that we're and we're projecting onto uh, them, of course, in, in our representations of them, this is happening within our own brain. Projections also has a neuroanatomical implication, like these connections between retrosplenial cortex and thalamus, these are the long range connections that help tie things uh, together. And of course, the, the projections that you have in, in, in movie theaters. But this, this richness of connotation, it turns out, didn't translate to every uh, European language. So the, uh, the Dutch uh, came back and said, that doesn't work. And so we had, they had to come up with a different word. Pro the literal translation of projections ends up being more mechanical and structural. Uh, and so they uh, uh, wanted us to use uh, insight uh, instead of a projection, which is what we did. But then the biggest surprise and the most funny thing was that um, even in English, the translation to English also didn't work from English. And so that the UK uh, uh, publisher felt there was too much of a negative connotation for the word uh, projections that it seemed uh, to convey that there was uh, something not real about uh, mental illness. And so they wanted us to use connections instead. Connections of course has its own uh, nice connotations, the connections that we form uh, in the brain and the connections we form with other people. So I was uh, okay with that. Um, but it shows that uh, uh, the challenges of, of translations and, and connections across languages and, and, and cultures. But I hope uh, the, uh, the stories though are universal and, and global and uh, relate to I, many of the issues that I've seen are, are topics of this uh, conference as well. And these connections, these long range connections across the brain that, that optogenetics has given us access to, these truly do uh, uh, help define uh, who we are and what we consider to be things that we have to care about. And the separability of what we care about and what we detect has, uh, I think, adaptive value. Uh, you think about why, why is this powerful process present? Why? from mouse to human, why is the circuitry apparently set up to allow us to separate stimulus detection from an affective or emotional response? And here the connection to trauma and the prevalence of dissociation and trauma, I think is very interesting. 
there is no question, if one considers it, that being able to separate out an emotional response, at least transiently during periods of trauma, uh, can be uh, helpful, can allow uh, adaptive and complex responses that are uh, not uh, disrupted by the storms of, uh, of emotion and, and trauma and stress that can happen uh, uh, in, in acute uh, situations. And so I consider this as, as something that is built into mammalian circuitry that's uh, normally adaptive, that certainly can become uh, maladaptive or problematic. And that's also uh, exciting to think about because that tells us that uh, we, we can indeed study the mice and start to think about questions that really were in the realm of, of the philosophical treatise, which is, which is fine and beautiful uh, progress can be made on that front. But now we can also connect those deep questions with, with real projections across the brain uh, uh, and well-defined uh, connections defined by, by origin and, and target. And a final note, just uh, it's, I think, quite remarkable that one can look at, at uh, all this progress and then realize uh, a further uh, depth to this approach, which is that um, getting extremely high resolution understanding with X-ray crystallography of how these microbial ion channels uh, work and redesigning them uh, as a biophysicist would uh, has given us the leverage uh, that we need to address these high level questions. For example, those optical experiments where we play in and read out with red and blue light, those were enabled in part by us redesigning this channel uh, to change the color that it responds to by making it uh, respond to red light instead of blue light. And we were able to do that initially only by our structural understanding and our structural modeling of the, of the channel. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a paradigm that's helpful and useful to consider in thinking about uh, curiosity-driven science and the explorations that need to be rooted in basic biology of odd organisms that do uh, curious and beautiful things. And the, then the final note, the final parable on the, the scientific process, which I think relates uh, closely to things we all care about is is just, uh, just exploration, even without a hypothesis. And that's what we were doing when we built these wide field microscopes to look all across the brain. We weren't looking for this. We didn't have a hypothesis that there was going to be an oscillation in one part of the brain. We didn't know what we would see, but we just looked. It was like pointing a telescope that we built to the sky and just looking. So it's another, you know, I, I have nothing against hypotheses and hypothesis driven science, but here's a case where just looking uh, mattered. I'm uh, uh, tremendously uh, grateful to all these uh, incredibly talented students and postdoctoral fellows who, who made all this work happen. I'll highlight just a few of them uh, initially. Um, the two people who really drove the dissociation work, uh, Sam uh, and uh, Isaac, graduate students in the lab, both now uh, graduated and, and, and uh, on to the next step in their careers. Also along with uh, Ethan Richmond, who did the NeuroPixels recordings. Uh, I see patients in the clinic. I don't do the stereo EEG uh, work, uh, uh, implantation and so on, of course, myself. We've got a wonderful neurosurgeon, uh, Jamie Henderson, and neurologist, uh, Joseph Parvizi, uh, who do that work. And we have a whole team that meets frequently, all the physicians that are involved, including myself as a psychiatrist, and uh, we're carrying out ongoing explorations of this uh, interesting phenomenon now as we, as we speak. And then finally, I'll just highlight the people who really did the structural work, uh, Yoon Kim, um, uh, Hideaki Kato, uh, and others got our recent crystal structures that enabled us to, to gain uh, access to these inner workings of uh, the channel rhodopsins and thereby inner workings of the mind. And with that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, again, thank you so much for this uh, tremendous honor and uh, for allowing me to, to share in, in this uh, community, which as I mentioned, I think is uh, really uh, wonderful, and I look forward to, to talking with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dysarot, uh, for this uh, amazing um, presentation. Uh, we, we, we have invited you 
more than two years ago. Um, but uh, the invitation turned out to be very timely now as your book is being released. So, <laughs> um, no. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think uh, <laughs> we need to, to thank you once again. And um, I can only virtually show your physical prize, but uh, <laughs> we will send it to you. Thank so, you. No, I, I think no. everyone can see it. Beautiful. Okay, thank you again. And now we have time for, I think, um, some questions from, from the audience. Um, Sarah can help me uh, with, with the order. <clears throat> so whoever wants to ask a question, you can just raise your hands or just write something in the chat and we'll give you the floor. Who's the first? In the meantime, uh, Carl, I'm, I'm curious about uh, the perspective of optogenetics uh, um, applied to human beings. What, what can you say about that? Yeah. This is one of the questions that got me most uh, interested in, in connecting with you. I've had uh, uh, one or two conversations with, uh, for example, with uh, Nita Farhani on this over the years uh, and probably uh, highly relevant to what many of you are, are thinking about. Um, the, first of all, there's questions of therapy uh, how you can treat disease. And secondly, there's a question of what neurophilosophical or neuroeth neuroethical issues come up. Certainly, uh, you can imagine therapeutic utility of optogenetics, uh, uh, even directly. You could imagine putting in opsins into the brain to change, uh, as we can with animals, almost anything about human behavior. And with a mouse, we can change almost anything we like. We can make the animal instantaneously more or less aggressive or defensive or nurturing or hungry, thirsty, motivated, uh, sleepy, uh, you know, anything you can think of, we can instantaneously change in terms of the motivational drive structure, preferences, priorities, as, as reflected in behavior and internal representations. And so that right away makes you think of any human disorder that is relevant to these, these, these drives and motivational structures, you can imagine uh, uh, changing. Um, of course, that leads readily into the neuroethical questions, but before I get to that in a moment, I'll just say that uh, you certainly could do this, but I think a more powerful therapeutic approach is uh, just to use the causal foundation that optogenetics provides to design uh, all kinds of therapies. And this is a key thing for the brain. Neuroscience, as you know, uh, heavily uh, correlational for a long time in terms of activity. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, just looking is great, as I just said, and uh, observing is very powerful. Uh, but uh, not knowing, if you start thinking about therapies, you wanna know what actually matters, what actually is, is making things happen. And so armed with the causal knowledge that uh, optogenetics brings, that opens the door. Once you know a cell type or projection is involved in a symptom manifestation, you could design any kind of therapy, a medication targeted to GPCRs that that cell expresses and so on. And that's what I think the real therapeutic opportunity is. It's very broad. Any modality becomes enabled uh, once you're standing on a strong foundation of, of causality. But then the, the questions of ethics come up quite quickly. Of course, you would wanna be considered very carefully that you don't uh, go down a, 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 a fraught route uh, with modifying uh, someone's uh, uh, motivational structure, and that's something important to consider. This doesn't also, it doesn't solve the deep questions relating to free will, but it also frames them very clearly. Uh, it's, optogenetics now has taught us, as if you didn't know before, you definitely know now that something as, as complex and distressing as instantaneous, you know, murderous violence of one organism to another member of its species 
can indeed be caused by adding just a few spikes, a few action potentials, and just a few cells. And this cannot now be denied, and it raises, uh, it, although it doesn't answer any questions, it, it frames them, I think, very starkly. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Federico Zilio, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Professor Desert, I was thinking, I was wondering whether you, you perform also a power load distribution. Uh, because I, I saw in, in, the, in the slides that you, at some point you show, you show the, some, uh, some of the power spectrums of the different regions. And uh, so I was wondering if you perform also uh, the, the calculation of the entire power load distribution of the power spectrum density to see if the, um, the, 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 the sliding of, of, the, of the peak was um, in, in general in the overall activity still present or only in some, some specific regions? Because it, this is what happens in, in, in ketamine humans. We have a, a slide of, of the alpha peak from, from eight or 10 to, to seven or to five hertz. So I was wondering if there is something similar. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. In, in, in effect, as there is power being taken away from somewhere else and, and added to this, to this peak, uh, for example, and, and other questions relating to the full uh, uh, power law consideration. We have looked at that. It does look as though, well, first of all, this, this enormous uh, peak that appears at, at one to three hertz, uh, um, it's not obviously taken from higher frequencies. We don't see uh, a significant drop in, in higher frequencies. It's a great question. Um, and that uh, comports with what we're also uh, seeing in the um, uh, uh, in both electrophysiology and with, with two photon. Um, but what we have not yet uh, reported is a detailed analysis of those higher frequencies. And, and that's something we hope to report both in the human and in the mouse work uh, in our next set of studies. But great question, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Please don't be shy. Sarah, I can't see any other answer raised. No, not yet. I don't see them. May I ask another question? So, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what's your take on the ethical concerns about um, misuses of optogenetics? Yeah, I, you know, this is one thing that also the the uh, you know when I when I teach my uh, uh, undergraduates about this. And I, I show them some of the videos that uh, that reflect what's possible with optogenetics and uh, you know how you can make uh, mammals instantaneously act as if their their drives and priorities are, are are fundamentally different. And when you extend this even to you know. Uh, Know, sensitive questions, you know, relating to violence, relating to mating behavior and other things, nurturing, uh, uh, parenting behavior, even. It, uh, it very often the, the students will almost seem to, um, they're, they're very upset by, by this. It's, it's it not, not, not angry, but just uh, disturbed uh, that there's a, that this is possible. Um, and, and they almost need a period of almost therapy for, <laughs> For a while just to, to talk about it, to, to get through it. Uh, uh, it is shocking to see the precision and speed with which this can happen, and it raises exactly the question of misuse. Um, and then, you know, what I do try to do as the professor is I, I try to help convey the perspective that this isn't entirely, you know, uh, 
I mean, other interventions have in the past been used to, to affect uh, uh, drive, certainly, you know, electrical stimulation, at least crudely, if you happen to hit the right region, you can cause uh, uh, aggression to happen. There's some classical studies of, of this where an electrode in the right place uh, will cause uh, uh, pronounced uh, aggressive responses in cats and, and so on. Moreover, we all know that we take we, we have medications that, that change our, our, our priorities, at least briefly, uh, drugs of, of abuse and, and recreation do that as well. So I, I try to convey that this is, is not an entirely, you know, it's, it's not completely new, right? It, it's, we, we've always been able to change our, ourselves, at least briefly. But what seems to be disturbing is the, is the precision. Uh, other methods always seem somewhat self-limited. You, you can't it seems harder to imagine, uh, you know, a widespread pattern of misuse of a of a psychedelic drug in society, uh, just because there would be so many side effects and complications that would come with it. But with optogenics, it raises this question of misuse because there's no obvious side effect. The precision allows you to just change the the, the property of interest without without anything else, and and that raises this misuse question. So you could say, for example, you know. Uh, Let's take eating uh, as the simplest, least controversial, maybe uh, uh, thing. But then you can imagine, you know, mating preferences and so on. You can imagine almost any other uh, domain of human behavior. You could imagine uh, tuning and changing. But let's cons consider eating disorders, for example. I I have patients who are um, who are thin and want to be thin and want to be dangerously thin, uh, and these are patients who have anorexia. I could, you know, you could imagine treating this by increasing their their hunger, their, their drive to eat. You might, that might be the first approach you might, might take uh, just to try to get them to eat. It certainly works in, in, in mice. You can take mice that, that aren't hungry and you can make them eat enormously just by tweaking one set of cells uh, deep in the brain and it's instantaneous and reversible. But that raises all kinds of questions. You know, uh, first of all, is that, is that the right thing to do? Uh, just increasing hunger. Well, the, the patients with anorexia are already hungry. They've just figured out a way to overcome it. They've imposed a new uh, countervailing influence in their, in their uh, drive structure that overcomes it. And so you would just be increasing their, their suffering by increasing the, the hunger. And so there's questions like this come up it, 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 with every possible, uh, uh, even the simplest, most seemingly most benign uh, applications. Then of course, misuse, you could imagine it being misused to change drive structures to ways that for whatever reason are are more adapted to the culture of the, of the moment and that of course is of concern thank you very much uh, we have a question by francesco stocchi please i can open the chat window oh he says i have a question okay hi hi can you hear me mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, thank you for the lecture, very interesting. Um, I have a question. Can we use optogenetics uh, for having a different take on uh, experiments like the one, like uh, the Libet experiment on free will, like to have a, a new take on this kind of uh, experiments? Thank you. Yeah, um, so I've, I've, I've read about those experiments uh, and thought a little bit about this. Um, I, I, have, uh, I haven't yet come up with the, the perfect experiment uh, on this question, um, but you, you can definitely get, an, uh, there are questions of uh, where patients report uh, timing of when they think they've taken an action and when they've come to the decision and there are interesting differences that arise in, uh, in those times. You can, with an animal, you can also have a, you know when its action is taken. You can also record from the brain. You can see when it looks like the neurons have decided to take the action. This is an interesting thing you can, you can definitely do in animals quite readily. Um, even though you're recording from tens of thousands of neurons and it's a very high dimensional space, one thing we found recently is, uh, we and others have found recently, is that uh, population activity doesn't follow all of these dimensions. It can be collapsed into a low dimensional space. And you can actually see there are certain trajectories that population activity take, takes when there's one choice is about to be made versus another. And, and so you can actually 
predict quite well when the brain has decided uh, uh, to take action and different parts of the brain come to that uh, decision point at slightly different times. And so that's interesting, uh, just observationally, you can see, okay, maybe the, the brain where we can most predict the decision made, that's where the uh, decision has been first made. And then is there another part of the brain that comes later that's more related to conscious experience or the sense of self or the sense of priorities or paths. And, and this could help some, explain some of these interesting experiments where uh, a decision has been made by part of the brain, but it hasn't yet uh, informed the rest of the brain uh, fully on, on the decision. And, and, these are th and then you could causally test that uh, uh, question with, uh, with optogenetics stimulation or inhibition of the candidate cells. So this is all very interesting. I, it hasn't really been done, but it, it could be done. Thank you. Uh, it's likely we have uh, much more time uh, for questions. So please. So uh, can I ask a, a question, a quick one, I hope. Um, so I was I was thinking when you were talking about misuse in, in therapy, um, I was actually thinking that maybe, uh, so my students usually get puzzled by the announcement possibilities of, of a lot of techniques. So I was wondering whether um, you have any thoughts on that or whether that is even more problematic or just as much problematic as in the case of therapy. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And again, this is, uh, as I'm sure you tell your students, enhancement is a, a very active issue anyway, separate in neuroethics, separate from uh, optogenetics. Um, uh, you know, in, in, for example, in terms of taking medications like uh, stimulants uh, uh, for, that are used for treating uh, ADHD, attention deficit disorders, are now widely used uh, sort of off-label by students who want to uh, work more effectively in school, and prepare for exams and, and so on. And, and this, is a, this raises a huge uh, ethical question relating to who has access to these, who is willing to make this step, are there uh, side effects? Uh, of course, we all, many of us take uh, caffeine quite regularly. That's a, a cognitive enhancer that has uh, many fewer concerns. Um, um, and again, it has both of them, though, have this uh, veneer of self limitation uh, for enhancement. You, there's only so much caffeine you can drink before you start to suffer side effects. The, the, and likewise, for the stimulants, there's you only can get so much of an effect before you are concerned about addiction and uh, agitation, anxiety, paranoia, psychosis. Uh, these are all things that can happen. And so for enhancement, uh, again, uh, with classical interventions, uh, there's this self-limitation. With optogenetics, there might not be uh, any limitation because you would be uh, precise. And so what, what could you do uh, in terms of enhancement? Um, first of all, uh, we know uh, quite readily now, we can quite readily increase the uh, energy, the effective energy level of uh, a mammal in terms of their willingness to devote energy to overcome a problem, to overcome a challenge, uh, to keep striving on, struggling on, even when uh, things have, have not been working. Um, we know, uh, for example, in, in deep brain structures like the dorsal raphae and the lateral habenula, with op precision optogenetic interventions, we can uh, turn up or down the animal's uh, energy uh, to, to meet a, a challenge with precise optogenetic interventions. And so you could, you could consider that as something that, uh, you know, uh, could be a form of, of enhancement. Uh, imagine uh, a group of people, and let's say there are many of them, let's say there were a million people in a country who uh, had twice the, the energy or motivation to, to overcome challenges as, as everybody else. And then you just imagine that, play that out, what happens, uh, you know, I think you would uh, start to see quite readily some societal disruption that, that would happen as a result. Um, 
So that's one form, and that's a, a nice general form of, of enhancement um, that uh, doesn't require, we don't need to know the detailed neural code for memory or, uh, you know, uh, for anything really, we just we're just generally turning up the precise activity of cells that subserve uh, motivation. So I think that's a nice example. It's it's interesting to think about. Of course, uh, memory also is uh, something that that we can now uh, control optogenetically. We can uh, cause recall of memories uh, by playing in activity to just a few cells, and we can cause a full memory to be recalled. So you could imagine enhanced uh, memory or targeted replay of, of memories that could serve as a, as a form of, of enhancement. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of interesting things to talk about. Is that, is that helpful? I, I think that the energy level is maybe the most accessible one. Thank you. Just a follow up. Maybe you know that the papers have been already published in um, ethics journals about the possibility of using optogenetics uh, um, in order to um, erase memories in, in a very um, precise way, uh, as in, in the movie, you know, the eternal, uh, the sunshine of, of the spotless mind. Um, okay, so sorry for, for um, yeah, the title. And um, do you think it is something doable in, in, the, in the near future? Yeah, memories are, uh, you know, there's, there's different ways. There, there are many levers you can, you can pull to, to disrupt memory formation. Um, you can keep a memory from being looked up. You can have it, it could, it could still be present, but it could not be found anymore. Uh, and, and that's one way you could do it. You could also have it, it could be found, but it, you could block its uh, access back into the conscious mind. That's an, another route you could take. And, and you could do those without affecting the memory itself. The memory would still be there. It would just no longer have uh, input or output to the conscious mind, which is pretty interesting. And, and those, that, that's doable um, more or less now. Uh, and, and then of course you can use plasticity mechanisms to, uh, to disrupt the synaptic strength changes that we think are involved in that are memories uh, and you could disrupt memories that way too. Uh, how specifically you could do that for one kind of memory or another, that's also accessible. We know memories can be fragile at the moment of recall. And so you could imagine a disruption of a memory paired with uh, pairing optogenetic intervention with an elicited recall of the memory. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh -oh. Sarah just wrote to me that uh, due to an unfortunate issue, Professor Roach uh, cannot be reached. Hmm. So, uh, we are very sorry that uh, her talk uh, should be cancelled uh, right now. And um, uh, we don't have other questions no, to Professor Desirot. Uh, we thank uh, him again, once again. And um, due to this, uh, and, uh, situation. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was reading a message on the chat. And um, we can uh, stop this session, unfortunately, uh, earlier than uh, what uh, we wanted to. But uh, in uh, half an hour, I think, we'll start the parallel session on the three rooms. Uh, I think everyone uh, has the, the link um, right to the specific room um, is choosing to, to attend. So, um, Sarah? Uh, we can have some announcing coffee, I guess. Okay. <laughs>
Yes. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Andrea.